So, uh, Charles, let me uh, introduce you to the assembly. Uh, we have people from Brazil and we have them from Russia and we have them from the UK and obviously from the US. Um, I, I think that's our, the, the crowd today. Um, basically, uh, Charles, can you start by telling us a little bit about your own Aikido journey? I know you do some Tai Chi as well. Which one came first and have, have you found them? So... <laughs> uh, she's uh, found her stage. So you, are, if I heard you correctly, you asked about my Aikido journey? Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, hello, everybody. It's nice to be here with you. And I, uh, I will do my best to wrangle <laughs> the cats into uh into some semblance so that we can have some concentrated conversation. Um, so in terms of Aikido, I think the very first time that I ever observed Aikido, um, I was on an island off the coast of Maine. I was a teenager and somebody came out to this island. We were living out there. It's a place with no electricity and no running water. The tide is your clock. And so it's very close to or the bones of the earth and the pulse of the sea. And there was a gentleman who came out to visit and he was crouched down on one side of the garden, just sitting there listening. He was a friend of a, of a dear friend. And he, in an instant, sprung into a forward roll and then stopped and sort of perched completely still. And something in my brain went, what was that? So a conversation ensued in which I heard about Aikido's existence. Time went by. I, had, I didn't find myself in a place or a time where, where Aikido would have entered my life, and at least not with my knowing. And then um, I was in college. I was 19 years old. I had just returned from a six-month research trip to India, where I worked as a photographer. And I came back and found myself in Madison, Wisconsin, which is where I was going to university. And it was February and it was cold and it was a difficult culture shock coming back to the United States. Going to India seemed quite smooth. Returning back to the United States was quite difficult. Mm -hmm. Memories of the suffering and the beauty that took place in India was then in counterpoint and juxtaposed with white picket fences and people complaining that their water wasn't cold enough or it wasn't hot enough, let alone the fact that they had water at the push of a button that was drinkable. And I had a very difficult time with that transition back to the States. And in this state of mind, in this limbic zone, I was walking down the street and literally saw a sign, <laughs> not an omen, an actual sign that said Aikido of Madison. And the sign was perched on the front of a, of a Quonset hut. And in the front of the Quonset hut, there was a fish store and a pet store. And in the back was this dojo that was maybe 15 by 15 feet, so five meters by five meters, maybe a little bit bigger, maybe six or seven meters. It was a square. And there were kind of pegboard all the way around painted white. There were little dots. So I, you've entered into a completely different space than you just left. And there were people in there practicing, rolling and moving. And you know, what we now know they were doing, you know, everything from Taino Henko to Koki Nages to Ikkyo Nikkyo Sanki Yonki, et cetera. But to my mind, these were people who were moving like water. These were people who were moving like the rest of the living world. As, and this was just immediately magnetic and attracted. And I sat down on the bench, took my shoes off, sat down on the bench and observed like a cat that couldn't take his or her eyes off of a piece of string that was floating around. I was mesmerized. At the end of the class, I spoke with the chief instructor who was teaching that day. That was Robin Cooper Sensei. And, uh, and her husband showed up, who was the also, the chief instructor, Dojo Cho, was John Stone Sensei, and um, found out when the next class was, and I showed up. And basically, 
within one day, <laughs> I was there five or six days a week, just completely enamored and wrapped. I had no idea that it would become such a big part of my life, but I knew that in that moment, it was. So what year was that? That was in 1986, so February of 1986. Right. Yeah. Okay, so you, I mean, that's a great start, great teachers to start with. Absolutely. How long were you with them? Well, I was with them for three years, and then I left and went to Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I worked as a ski patrolman for a season. And there was a dojo there, which was very high altitude in Santa Fe. I think it was the highest altitude dojo in the States at the time. So <laughs> you're definitely breathing pretty heavily. And, um, and that was run by um, a guy named Dennis Abbott. He was a Chiba guy. And, um, and I was there for one year. And that was an intense zone. That was like, put on your battle face and try to survive through this thing, this ordeal. And, you know, I was young enough that I just sort of thought that was what Aikido was and you just grin and bear it and do it. And so, although that's not my modality of study these days, um, I learned some valuable things. I remember one particular time where it was, you know, knife takeaways and he told me to attack him and I did and like a ski and he threw me Kotegaish and took the knife away and I'm in that instant on my back on the ground and he took the knife and he threw it right to where my head was and I got out of the way and stood up and he said there that's that was the best ukemi you've done in six months and I was one part of me was taking it in as the flatter and the other part of me was saying f you <laughs> you jerk you <laughs> the knife on my face but within that paradox was some memory I, I do remember it and uh, it's, it's a valuable lesson nonetheless I I went from there to the West Coast and I was at um, Aikido West with Frank Duran Sensei for, um, and I see Rob is giving that the big thumbs up. I was um, there and, and I would go over the mountains to Linda Holiday Sensei's in Santa Cruz. And, uh, but I was living in Redwood City in San Carlos, which is on the peninsula, working as a newspaper reporter by week and a catering chef on the weekends and wow. training a lot. What year was that? What year was that? That would have been, I'm really bad with the years, Paul, because I, I'm one of these people where time is all melanged together. I actually have to look at my CV to know where I was. <laughs> but it was, um, in terms of the arc of my training, it was like year five, something like that, year four or five. Right. Um, after a year of that. I got to Aikido West the year after that. Oh, really? Yeah. Darn, I just missed you, Rob. Um, but um, then I moved north to Humboldt County and lived way off the grid um, on the Lost Coast Wilderness. And this, I, I ended up teaching at an alternative high school. And this was when I first um, sort of cut my teeth as a teacher, discovered my vocation as a teacher and entered the the profession of education or the vocation really, the calling. And it was also the beginning of Aikido in the schools because it was a school. Um, it was not the formal beginning of Aikido in the schools as a business entity, but it was the first time that I brought Aikido into a school. So I was teaching at the school and obviously I already gotten the bug for Aikido. So I had to figure out a way, there was no dojo in the Valley. So I called my first teachers John and Robin, and I asked for their permission to open a dojo. So and, um, when you say you brought Aikido into the school, I mean, that could mean you've just opened up a dojo and got the kids practicing, but did it go further than that? In terms um, of the ethos that it, maybe you brought to your class? Well, certainly the ethos was there and it was a small alternative high school way out in the country. So um, every person in the community brings an element of ethos to the overall community. First of all, you would have to have a certain amount of resonance with what was already there to even feel a sense of belonging. But then each person really does contribute their bring. And Aikido definitely informed mine and still does obviously, but it, um, yes, then, and students would come. They were, it was not a mandatory course, but many students attended and it was in a barn. Um, 
not quite like the construction of Rob's there uh, because it was a California barn, not a New England barn. And yet um, I found a whole bunch of carpets and we laid down three layers of carpets and we put the best one <laughs> on top. <laughs> so there was this elaborate system of setting up the mats, you know, by laying out all these puzzle pieces of carpets. And then the, the one nice carpet went over the full top and we created a little kamiza. And that was where we trained in the barn at the Petrolia High School in Petrolia, California. So I like the way that you said that at the school, everybody brings their stuff and, and kind of it all melds together to form the school as it is. But did what you brought through Aikido influence some of the other teaching? Yes, in the sense that other teachers came to my class. So as, a, as most small alternative schools are, they're really, and we'll get to this later perhaps, less of a school and more of a learning center in the sense that, yes, it's a school and there are classes, but everybody learns, everybody grows, everybody evolves through the process of being involved in the community, whether you come in with your parent, and drop off a kid or a parent who stops and teaches a class, maybe a parent who gets involved and takes Aikido or, or uh, any number of interconnections that you could have with that community, everybody grows. And so school, not thinking like classrooms, curricula, benchmarks, timelines, and, and learning outcomes, but uh, an environment in which growth and evolution happens. Okay. Um, and so, yes, it definitely informed parents who came and teachers who attended the classes. And, and then other community members showed up. In fact, two um, from Japan who had left Japan, moved to the, the mountains of Humboldt County, and thought that they would never practice Aikido again. And um, they showed up one day where I was living. And it was like a Saturday morning and like, ah, asked me, excuse me, excuse me, are you, are you Charles Colton? And I hear you're teaching Aikido. And I said, yes, yes. And, um, and the woman said, uh, can I ask one favor? I said, yeah, sure, anything at all. And she said, can you please, please make Ikkyo with me? So she, <laughs> Shomenuchi, and they're in the middle of a horse pasture. I, I did my best to give an Ikkyo feeling to her. And I swear, like her whole body wiggled like she was wagging her tail. And they came to classes. And after I left the valley, they opened a dojo and continued that lineage um, of Aikido in that little remote valley. Subsequently, when they handed it off, they, they gave it to their senior students who are still there and that dojo still exists in this tiny little mountain valley that was started at the Petrolia High School and handed off to the Honeydew Dojo and now handed off to the Matol Valley Aikido Club. Fantastic. And uh, so we're now, what are we, what are we, something 20 plus years later, 25 years later, that dojo still exists with maybe six people in it, <laughs> you know? Fantastic. So, and, yeah. I mean, Aikido in the schools obviously has been a major part of your life now. Yeah. Why is it important to bring Aikido into the schools? What, what, what do you think it gives kids? Well, I'm probably preaching to the choir here because I'm seeing that everybody here, I'm assuming is Aikidoka. There are a lot of people who see the recording, so we don't know what okay. choir we're singing to. Well, one fascinating thing about Aikido, and I believe O Sensei wrote about this, I can't remember if I'm paraphrasing correctly, but it, it completes that which is lacking. I think there's something out of uh, O Sensei's The Art of Peace that talks about how Aikido completes that which is lacking. And by lacking, I don't mean broken or wrong or anything like that, but I'll give you an example. If a uh, if a young teenager shows up in my Aikido in the school's dojo and they're full of like bravado, ego and tough exterior, they tend to soften and start to discover that receptivity and quiet may have a strength. Conversely, if they show up and they're kind of hollowed out and feeling like they're weak or they're expecting to be victimized or bullied by an experience, they tend to come forward a little bit more and open. So if a student comes uh, one direction, they may find what complements their emotional development 
social development. Intellectual development gets sharper and their physical development improves. Okay, so that's all of which is to say, uh, sorry, Quentin, but all of which is to say that it helps to literally and figuratively round out an education. Okay. Um, so, so it might not provide it. I love your answer, but you know, for those who, who would just see Aikido as a bunch of techniques you've talked about intellectual development, emotional development, I think there was a third one, was it spiritual development? Physical uh, and social. Physical I mean, and social. So, yeah, I mean, I think spiritual development exists, but I don't really emphasize that in school. That's fine. We, we've, we've had a few sessions on that topic, and I, we know why you kind of avoid it. Um, so um, the interesting thing is, what is it then about Aikido? Again, you may be preaching to the converted, but it's nice to hear your words, that you think helps people develop in those other ways beyond the technique. Well, part of it is being introduced to the possibility of another way of being. Uh, another thing is actually having the opportunity to practice this other way of being so that one's entire neural network is educated in an alternative way of being from perhaps what they might have seen or experienced from various role models or the, the larger cultural mythologies in which we grow. Um, again, another example, one exercise we do is called the scoochy scooch. So if you imagine, yes, yeah, because you scoot your feet, but one, one person has their palm up. The other person puts their palm on top of it and you imagine that there's Velcro and you wrap it up with duct tape and get it stuck together and it's a follow the leader game where the person with their hand on top leads and the person with their hand on the bottom follows. So what we notice is that the body never lies. So one person may have great difficulty making contact. They're kind of intimidated by the idea of even making contact. Another person may make contact just fine, but they have a hard time staying in contact. And lastly, a person may be able to make contact and stay in contact, but it feels so good they cling to it and can't let go of it. <laughs> and in the process of doing this, not only can we as an instructor diagnose what is going on with this person's sort of social proclivity. But through the process of practicing it, they get better at being able to initiate and connect, stay connected, and then at an appropriate time, finish the contact. And this obviously has implications for verbal interactions because we speak, carry on a conversation. At some point we say, thank you very much, goodbye. So here's my next question then. So um, I can I do that exercise, by the way. So I know how, how well that works. Do you actually say to them, and when you're practicing this exercise, it will help you because you know, you're either undercooking it or you're overcooking it or, or whatever. So do you actually make the link to how this will help them in other aspects of their life? Well, what I can say is um, I try to draw out the link without hammering it down their throats. Um, as you all know, um, teaching and learning is a delicate dance because I want to teach, but I really want them to discover. Um, so how explicit or how implicit, how structured and how uh, hands-off really depends upon the collection of individuals who are there their physical and their emotional and their psychological makeup in that moment. And it's constantly changing. So whether or not I would explicitly state it really depends on the context. And that context is constructed by the people who are in the room. And also the student, presumably. So some students can need a bit more leading and others not so much. Precisely my point, you know, that they, they are the context. And what, they're, what the situation is calling for uh, presents itself. And if I am, receptive enough as a, as a person and as a teacher, then I'll have a sense of when to explicitly enter and give that kind of feedback and when to just sit back and allow them to discover it on their own. Yeah. So you started Aikido in a school, but at some point it became Aikido in the schools. Tell us Correct. about that journey. 
So my personal journey took me much farther afield from that. Uh, I was there in that community for about, at that time, for about four or five years. And, uh, and my own personal sojourn has taken me um, through different places and dojos in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, and Latin America. And um, I found myself actually back in that valley again many years later. And uh, because I love that place <laughs> so much and, uh, and the people in the community there. So I, um, at that point, I brought these two streams of my life together, Aikido and schools. Over the years, I continued to be a teacher. Over the years, I continued to, to be a student of Aikido. And um, when necessary, I would teach, but my preference was always to be a student in a dojo and continue on in that role. But after a while, I realized that not only had I learned how to be a teacher through years of teaching, this was probably 20 years into teaching. And I felt like the most important thing that I had to teach, to share and to give and bring to the world was Aikido. I could teach through literature or I could teach through uh, ultimate Frisbee or I could teach through visual arts or music. But I felt like the most important thing, the most important bring that had been shared with me that I wanted to then pay forward was Aikido. And so I brought these two together and I had a program at a high school in that valley, at the middle school. And then I ran two more programs out of the community center. One was for tiny tots and toddlers who before going to school. And then also um, an adults program for classical Aikido and continuing that. So I had tiny tots, elementary and middle school, high school and adults all in that same community, which has maybe 1500 people in it total. So it's very small scale. Right. And I did that for two years um, in that place. And um, this, what happened is in California at right around that time, um, the budget started getting cut. The school budgets were getting cut horribly Teachers were getting what we call in the United States pink slips, which is basically your walking papers saying you're fired. Uh, we'll let you know in August whether or not you have a job, that kind of a thing. So they'd fire them at the end of the school year and maybe hire them in August. And the writing on the walls for me was uh, this extra program of Aikido is going to get cut. So rather than waiting for it to get cut, I uh, made the crazy move to New York City from the farthest west you can go looking over the Pacific Ocean to the east looking over the Hudson River as it's about to jump into the Atlantic. And I entered a, um, a graduate school program in educational leadership at Columbia University. And that was a full year program. So it was like six graduate level classes per semester for two semesters. So a one year intensive program, a master's degree. Um, and I brought Aikido in the schools as a part-time thing. So I was a full-time student and a part-time Aikido in the schools instructor teaching at two different schools at the time. So how um, did you, uh, so this is an interesting point. I mean, wherever you've been, you don't seem to have had too much difficulty in actually opening up at least a school or two, which many would find daunting to do. So. What, what was it, how was it that you, you managed to find your people being receptive to what you were offering? What was the message you gave them? You know, I mean, to the first point, I have no idea how or why these things happen. It's kind of a mystery. Uh, I mean, it definitely involves persistence. I cold called a lot of administrators. Um, I spoke with people about this vision, about what I was trying to do, and sometimes they would say, oh, you should really talk to so-and-so, and then I would go talk to so-and-so, I'd follow up, and maybe it would be a dead end, or maybe they'd say, you know what, you should really go speak with blah, 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 and I would just continue following that thread um, for as long as possible until things, eventually, I would be communicating with a progressively-minded administrator or some other person who had the power to say, yes, let's try a pilot project. And this is where we get to your second part of your question, because uh, I find that some of the language that was most, um, most well-received 
was to tell people, look, you can just try it. You're not committed. You're not hiring me for five years. You don't have to give me health benefits today. Let's try it and see how it works. We'll try a pilot project with some of your students. And that was something that a lot of them were interested in doing because um, their commitment was low at that point. And the potential was, was high for some sort of a positive outcome for their students. And to that point, I mean, you asked, what did I tell them? I told them very similarly, you know, very similar things to what I was saying earlier, that it helps people to develop social and emotional intelligence, communicative competence, self-regulation, mental discipline and focus, and to do it all in a physical way. So they are educating their body, mind, and emotional intelligence all at the same time. And usually a, a principal will go, hmm, that sounds good. How much does it cost? And that's what I wanted them to ask. I wanted them to get to the point where they were invested enough to say, well, what do you want from me to make it happen? And in some cases they had nothing to offer and we still might do it. In other cases they said, let's do this thing. Let's buy the mats, let's get some cake cookies. Let's and there was the, the full range um, of responses from those different administrators. Uh, but well, the message was always, you can help these kids by helping them integrate body, mind, spirit. Not always in those words. Yeah. Um, because you have to kind of speak the pedagogy speak. Yeah. Um, but I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, it does. I mean, I think what you've illustrated is you've got to fall down a lot and keep getting up. <laughs> That's right. What Aikido teaches us, right? Okay, so, so you're going through this graduate school. You've managed to open up one or two schools. What happens then? What happened then was the graduate program ended and the phone kept ringing. For some reason, more schools wanted Aikido. Um, word of mouth had traveled and the programs started to extend beyond Aikido and beyond just schools. So um, I started incorporating Tai Chi for the middle schoolers. Physical contact was a little bit daunting for the seventh graders. Um, they loved it. They almost loved it too much. It would make them so giddy they couldn't concentrate. So I started to begin with my programs for the first semester. That's about four months or so out of the four and a half months out of a 10 month program. In September through Christmas, I would start with Tai Chi. Okay, and now, just back up a second and say, when did Tai Chi come into your practice? Oh, uh, it actually, it came into my practice way back then in, uh, on the West Coast. Right. I, I'd always thought, oh, uh, I'd seen people practicing Tai Chi in the park before and I thought, oh, that looks beautiful. Uh, I'm, I'll do that when I'm old. <laughs> All the old Chinese people in the park practicing Tai Chi and Qigong, and I thought, oh, I'll do that when I'm old. And then I had an opportunity because there was somebody who was, you know, living in that same little valley who was practicing, and I asked, um, you know, can you teach me some? And he said, sure. And once I started, I was like, oh, oh, this well runs deep. I should have started this sooner, <laughs> you know? So, um, I think I've been practicing Tai Chi and Qigong for about um, over 20 years now, 23 years or so, and Aikido more than 30. Um, so Aikido came first, but then when I discovered Tai Chi, it definitely became a, a sister practice. So uh, although, of course, they're not exactly the same, they're very much uh, underneath them. They share an awful lot. And I would imagine it on both sides of the coin, it deepened your practice. Definitely. I mean, they're both involved in the study and practice of the movement of chi or ki. And, and, you know, with Aikido, it's more explicitly the, the idea that we're trying to harmonize these energies, but it's clearly incorporated into Tai Chi and Qigong as well. But instead of necessarily harmonizing with another human, as you might in Tai Chi push hands or in Aikido practice, you're harmonizing with earth and sky and trees and birds and everything. So it's, um, you know, it's, same principles, perhaps. Right. Now that, that, that's something I, I've already, already noticed. You were singing that, that, that tune right from the beginning. It keeps coming up as a theme that you're very, very connected to your environment and, and, and the surroundings and appreciation of nature, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely, some of my best teachers, no doubt. And, and it's, even, it's even ridiculous to even speak of it that way in some ways, because it's just one big thing. 
<laughs> and we're all part of it. So yes, that is a theme of, of my worldview and the ethos with which I try to live my life. Yeah. Do you want to give us an example of maybe when you were sitting by some water or watching the wind go through the trees or whatever it was that you thought, hey, wow, that's important and it taught you something? Um, the one that comes to mind now, there are many, but the one that comes to mind, especially as it relates to Aikido, is perhaps the, the best Tenkan, the best Taino Henko that I ever feel that I've been able to participate in. And I was in a river up to my neck with my knees slightly bent, and I was facing upriver. And I just started playing with the uh, as the current was coming toward me, I would turn my body and my shoulders to one side and feel the turbulence patterns and then face off again. Sorry, this thing just popped out. And I would, I would turn to one side or another and feel whether or not I was receiving the power directly into my chest or turn slightly into a hanmi and feel what it did on the omote side and the ura side. And then I would come back and do the other. And, and then I thought, oh, I'm just going to lift my hands up here in front and settle into that and feel what the river did. And at a certain point, I found my axis and the shape, and I just turned completely around. And I went from facing upriver to facing downriver, basically doing a tenkan. But the river was the uke. And um, I didn't add anything to it. It just happened, <laughs> you know, I was there. The river. And that um, is one example of how um, this both connectivity with the rest of the animate and living world, as well as an Aiki form of sorts practice interacted to deliver a very important lesson. I'm not sure that I can articulate it. It was somewhat ineffable. No, but no it, not at all. I think you've articulated it really, it, really well. You probably felt a similar thing. So it, it, I probably don't even have to explain more. No, I think you did a great job. OK, so the phone keeps ringing. You're getting people from all over the place asking you to come in and do stuff. Um, I'm sorry. I just popped over and looked at the chat for a second and my attention waned. Can you repeat the question, please? So I was just bringing you back to where you were. You finished the graduation program. People keep ringing you. The phone's going. You're in demand. What happens next? And, and I guess the part I haven't fleshed out was how it became, I told you how it became more than Aikido because it became, you know, Taiji and Qigong came into it um, and other things as well positive psychology and neuroscience, what have you, started to inform the teachings. But, um, but then it became uh, more than just schools. Uh, I ended up working with judges, like New York City judges, and using Aiki principles and practices to teach them conflict resolution strategies for dealing with managing conflict in a way that's non-combative, right? But not also not victimizing oneself in the position. So that became part of the New York City administrative law judge trainings. And that so who are these judges having conflict with? Because <laughs> I imagine them being in control of the court. You know, it's hard to think who they're fighting with, but you're obviously going to tell us. Well, part of probably the biggest thing they fought with was technology. <laughs> so the, when, when one broadens the idea of conflict to include uh, conflict within oneself, conflict with the rest of the environment or with your coworkers, your managers, your boss, your caseload, the, the feeling that things are going too fast and you're being stressed out by the demands made upon you. And then uh, lawyers are in the room and they're in conflict with one another and you're supposed to be a neutral. And um, the way that one guy talked about it when he would frame and introduce me frame the session we were about to do. He said, you know, we're in the conflict business. He was a judge. He said, we're in the conflict business. We invited into the room. So not being afraid of it and learning how to engage in that environment in a way um, that is healthy so that everybody knows that they're heard. So everybody's voice is actually heard. Everyone actually gets their day in court. How is it that we as judges can hold the space and interact with others so that we ensure that this process runs smoothly. Wow. So that was kind of the way that, that he talked about it in introducing me and sort of the goals that he had hoped would come out of it. And 
from there, it just kind of continued. I ended up teaching seminars in local universities in New York and the judges, um, the police force, New York City police force. We did de-escalation tactics as well as conflict resolution. Um, it continued in schools and in various businesses that wanted to sort of reduce the amount of unnecessary conflict in the workplace. Okay, so did there come a point where you couldn't meet the demand and that you had to kind of bring in other people that you knew and sp you know, spreading this fantastic work that you're doing? Well, thank you for that, um, your kind words. Um, yes, it ebbed and flowed and there were times that I brought people on um, as their availability allowed and their schedule allowed and as the work demand allowed. So I did um, train people and they would take over a class, a kid's class here or an adult's class there. And, and I would work with them in terms of um, best practices in pedagogy and we would train. So I would sort of share my understanding of Aikido with them. But I always gave them the autonomy to create their classes as well, because I think in order for it to be truly authentic, it had to come out of their experience. And then let them go. I'm quite interested in exploring that because it's not very common to teach the teachers in Aikido, at least. Yeah. Uh, kind of, you're, you're told, go off and open a dojo, or I'm going to go and open a dojo. And that's normally what happens. And people make their own mistakes and, and find their own way. Um, so how did you get that balance between, okay, when you're working on this program, I need you to know this stuff. After that, it's up to you, but I need to make sure that you know this stuff. How yeah. did that work with, with the individuals you were working with? Because presumably there must have been fairly good teachers for you want to want to involve them in the first place. Yeah, I mean, there was a, there was a range of experience. Um, definitely, I, I saw in each of them the ability to become a good teacher or a great teacher. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have allowed them to put on the Aikido in the schools logo, right? And I wouldn't let them represent the, the, the entity if I didn't believe in them. But they came with varying degrees of, of experience. And so I worked with them. And I made it explicit at the beginning that, that this is part of the job, that your continuing education is part of the job. Um, and I made it explicit that it's part of my job too. Like I'm going to lead by example. I'm constantly learning how to be better at communicating. I'm trying to constantly be better, not just at technique in Aikido on a mat, because if that's where it stops, it's probably useless. Um, but if those things inform me how to become a better person, a better communicator, then, then and so again, um, without belaboring that, I just explicitly told them it's part of the job and we did staff development. And this also branched out somewhat organically and I've taught um, basically best practices in pedagogy for Aikido instructors. And um, I, it's a program I call Teaching for Mastery. And, um, and it draws upon principles from neuroscience. It draws upon positive psychology draws upon best practices in pedagogy, multiple intelligences, um, experiential education, outdoor education, Aikido, Tai Chi, Qigong, um, and brings it together into this, what I hope is as comprehensive a package for, um, for helping teachers to better communicate whatever it is they're trying to teach. And then how do you, how do you motivate how do you help people encode memory in a way that they can then retrieve those memories? Um, how, what does the neuroscience teach us about learning and how can we use everything from the differentiation of audio, visual, tactile, experiential, linguistic, musical, rhythmic possibilities to help either initiate concentrated focus, carry it through, and then drop it down in such a way that it's remembered and remembered and builds community and, and team spirit at the same time. So there are many things, many more than I know that have been learned and discovered in the last 60 years about this. And then probably the last 6,000 years as well. Like how does one do this and do it well? And, um, and so, um, I have taught 
those courses in teaching for mastery in Europe and the United States. And, uh, and I've done some, some recordings that will become a podcast to that effect. Um, and I've tried my hand with video, but I'm not yet comfortable with the results to share it. Um, maybe someday. Hmm. Well, perhaps, perhaps it needs to be done in this type of format, somebody asking you the right questions and allowing you to respond, because you're doing a pretty good job here, I think. Um, um, so what I really like about this is, or one of the many things I like about this, is the fact that it's so evident that you have, your Aikido journey has been informed by looking at so many other things and pulling them into the Aikido and expanding what, what you otherwise could possibly have done. And I, I, I have to say, I think, you know, Aikido isn't like set in, a, in a, a tomb or whatever. It's not a statue. It should be a growing living art where people are bringing new stuff to it. Um, what's been the most important thing that, that's influenced your journey? Was it the Tai Chi or is it some of your teaching, uh, the things that you've learned through teaching? Or is it something else? That's really difficult to, to say. I, I have to say, Quentin, that I'm, I'm, I'm pretty bad at those questions that say, you know, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Or what's the most important thing that ever influenced you in your Aikido life? I, I really, I have a hard time placing it on a hierarchy. Um, That's fine. Yeah, I, I, I'm lousy at those questions. I like a lot of different ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, do you want to list the ice creams that you've tasted then? What are my favorite? I don't know. Layla seems to think my daughter Layla. What's my favorite, honey? She suggested that maybe mango was my favorite because yellow is my favorite color. Nice. No, so, it, it's very hard to say, Quentin. Um, but you know, in Aikido already from what I've told you so far, I mean, the progression went from, from John Stone and Robin Cooper Sensei being my first primary influences. And of course the senior students in that dojo as well, because the whole dojo makes them experience, not just the instructors. And, um, and then, you know, from there to Santa Fe for a year and then to, to Frank Duran's dojo at Aikido West and then North, I practiced with Tom Reed Sensei up there because uh, he was in Arcata, which was the closest dojo. So I would train with him and, and the journey continued. I lived overseas. I lived in Europe. Uh, I was in Stockholm for five years in the dojo with Jan Nevelia Shihan and, and his other right hand, left hand uh, co-padre was um, named Yorma Lili Sensei. He was a phenomenal instructor, both highly influenced by uh, Ropokai Daitoru and by Aikido and a true Aiki wizard. Uh, he hasn't come to the United States because he doesn't fly on airplanes, but Jan Nevelia Shihan does, so he's he's come over. But that dojo was very influential in my Aikido life, and through them I met Endo Seishiro Shihan, who became my primary teacher and still is to this day. Um, and so I met Endo Sensei in the year 2000. Actually, it was late 1999, but basically from 2000 to the present, he's been my primary teacher. And so my Aikido journey has been influenced along these different styles or branches of the, the tree of Aikido, yeah. starting with the roots of Daitoru, Spear, Aiki Jiu-Jitsu, and what have you, and then coming up into the trunk, which was O-Sensei, and then all the major branches that branched out. And, and so I have, I have been down many of these tributaries, um, on, and they've influenced yeah, we're well, hugely helpful, but your map, it seems to me, has gone a bit wide in that, and you've always got your eyes open, and if there's something there, you pick it and bring it in, which is great. Um, okay, so um, where are you on the journey now with Aikido and the schools and Circle 1, 2, 3? I mean, is it just a, just full on, or, or where's it at? Well, obviously, we've all experienced a, an ecological disturbance, an upheaval in the in the field, right? Um, and um, when it became clear that we were going into COVID lockdown, I was actually hosting Jan Nevelia Shihan here in the States when it all hit. Yeah. And uh, we canceled the rest of his tour and sent him back to Sweden. And I 
canceled all the seminars that I was slated to teach. I closed the dojo and I closed all the school programs. Just felt like, okay, this is real, change. Just like, you know, Shomenuchi's coming. You can either stand there and let it hit you or you can get off the line yeah. and try to uh, redirect. And that's what I did. I changed and I, I closed down all those programs. I didn't want to put students or teachers in the path of harm. And um, since that was my livelihood, unfortunately my wife works remotely and was able to continue working. And my daughter who was four years old, basically three going on four at the time. Um, well, five. You're five now, but she was three going on four at the time. Um, she, um, we decided not to have her go back to the nature-based preschool that she was in um, because of the risk factor was too high. Um, and so I homeschooled and she and I would get up and make lists and play games and do projects and research projects and practice some Aikido and learn how to ride a bike and do all that stuff. And so after um, 30 years of experimenting with other people's children, <laughs> I got an opportunity. <laughs> yeah, you made the mistakes on those other kids, right? <laughs> I'm still making mistakes, but yes. Um, and so for the last year, that's what, uh, what I've been doing. I've done a little bit of remote teaching. Some of my students from before continue to work with me um, online. And I've even, I've even gotten some new students, which was completely baffling and surprising, but uh, I think we've been able to learn some stuff. And, um, and uh, so as we're now in this emergence, Reemergence. Um, thinking about what next steps might be. Uh, I've also enrolled in, and I'm, I'm partway into a, a doctoral program in education, uh, which has been remote. So I was able to continue and make use. I'm trying to think, like, how can I make use of this time, right? Like, what can I do with this chapter? And so, um, so that's underway. We'll see how it continues and goes and flourishes or not. And um, thinking about what's next and the immediate what's next, I can say, is that um, in the month of July, I'll be teaching Aikido at a summer camp in New Hampshire. And um, I'm moving the mats up there on Sunday and um, my daughter will attend the camp um, and I will be teaching up there through the month of July. Um, and then the mats will be staged up there. <laughs> and and, and it, it's in a school that is working as a summer camp. And I have been consulting with this school and working together with the head of school there. The school has been reimagining itself. It also shut down as a result of COVID, but also other demographic shifts in the region. It can no longer just be a standard alternative high school in the mountains of New Hampshire. So it has gone through a process of reimagining itself as a semester school or a year long school. We don't know yet. Um, with the emphasis of training the next generation of climate leadership oh. and social justice leadership. That to take kids who are in a senior year of high school or a gap year before going to college and to give them a solid dose of leadership training, climate science and social facilitation. So facilitation practices for, for working with groups and that this will be their curriculum. And I said, how about having a dojo? <laughs> and, they, and they put it on the schedule. And well, they're hoping that uh, they can receive the first students into this program in September of 2022. So wow. not the coming year, but the following year, I'm hoping to have a dojo embedded in this school for climate responsible leadership and social justice leadership for these, you know, rite of passage moments in a person's life in Western culture going from a senior year in what we call high school to uh, a gap year before they go to college and they start trying to figure out who am I, what do I want to do, where do I want to put my energy and um, and that is the same location where I'll be teaching my summer camp this summer. So Aikido in the schools is going to camp. <laughs> Sounds good. I may well ask you to come back because one of the sessions I've wanted to run is the link between Aikido and, and the environment, climate. 
Uh, and uh, I think you might be the man to talk about that. So we'll talk about that separately. But we've got to about eight o'clock now. And at that point, I always like to open it up to everybody else. So if you're game for that, uh, let me just see what people have got to ask or, or points they want to make. So you know how it goes, guys and girls. Um, ha hands up if you want to say something to Charles. Go on, Rob. Uh, Charles, very, uh, there were pieces of your story I did not know, and I was thrilled to hear them. Um, the, um, as someone who um, claims to teach political Aikido, I, I think that there's a conversation for us to have uh, about this, about all these climate change activists. But um, if you, what is your go-to Aikido introductory move. In other words, you meet a stranger and you're trying to explain Aikido and you have the chance to, you know, touch. What's your go-to, you know, intro to Aikido spiel look, seem, sound like? It's an interesting question. Uh, I'm not sure I have one, um, but I might. So, you know, I, I guess, again, similar to the whole question about, you know, how structured or how improv to be with a group full of students, it, it feels like a similar kind of question calling for a similar kind of response that it depends a lot on the person. You know, some people show up and, and you can just feel that they want to know whether or not this is going to be effective in a street fight. And other people show up and you can feel that they are really curious about the social and emotional con, you know, development that can come out of a communication art, somatic communication art like Aikido. And depending upon what it is that I'm kind of feeling from them, I might respond in a different way. Um, can you give me an example of a question and then I might be able to sort of dovetail with it? Cause I don't think I have a single form, you know, that I would go to. No, I mean, I, I will often, when I'm doing this, it, it is often um, unbendable arm, mm -hmm. but it's all, it's sometimes it's also, you know, shake my hand and then, you know, something is happening to their wrist and they're walking backwards and, you know, or now you're going to want to, you're going to want to bend your knees. You're going to want to, you know, bow, you're going to want to walk backwards as you go from, you know, Ikkyo and Ikkyo Sankyo. Um, but, uh, I mean, I've always thought that the trick is to hook them with something because, I mean, and, and you're right that everybody may be most susceptible to, you know, their own hook and it, it could be different. Yeah, um, what I find, Rob, is that, you know, um, again, like any learner, they have their particular way of, of, you know, their portal, their entry point. And, and for some person, it, they might really be interested in the philosophical sort of underpinnings or how it relates, you know, to saying yes and instead of no but. Or they may be very kinesthetic and they really just want to feel what this is. Um, if, uh, if they fall into those categories, it might be a different response. One thing I sometimes do is if a partner will grab me katate dori, mm -hmm. and, and I will express um, first, what does it feel like to them if I try to struggle to get away from them? Mm -hmm. What does it feel like to them if I try to struggle against them? And I'll say, look, if I'm just trying to touch my own forehead like this, if I think I have to fight against you and get away from you first and then touch my forehead, then it feels like this and they can feel how difficult it is for both of us. And then I say, but if I just relax and touch my forehead and they, they end up going like this and they get a sense of how it might feel if somebody is not competing with them to just be connected with that. Yeah. And then we can flesh it out some more. So that's one way, especially for that's somebody good. who needs to feel it. So a kinesthetic learner who really needs to feel it. It might just be katate dori. That's fine. I know Musubi. Vitaly, I saw your hand go up. 
Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you for rich stories and everything you told. But uh, it's really amazing for me because, you know, we were trying in, in, in approximately in a week, we're going to bring uh, kids with disabilities into Dodger to start uh, practicing with them because we are working on this program it's, and it's happened so that uh, today we get this session about that about kids and i see you that you really love working with kids and i also uh, finished teachers training university and i used to work in in texas a special needs camp with kids and we're trying to put this program together because you know we get a group of uh, adults with uh, disabilities and we're bringing in uh, kids and we're gonna unite these groups so they, we, we could work together with them. Their parents are gonna be around too and they really want to do it. And I just wanted to say thank you for everything you shared with us. And in case uh, our like to ask you in case I will need uh, some help with information because uh, you got such a rich background, including Qigong, psychology, pedagogical, and everything. If you could uh, give some advices if I need some. You got it. I would also echo right back at you, Vitali. Um, first of all, sorry if I mispronounced your name, but I would say um, absolutely. And thank you for the work you're doing. That sounds fantastic. Um, um, may I suggest I put you two together after this session? I'll, I'll share an email with you and then it's up to you two to find some time to talk, I think. How about okay, that? Sorry, here's, here's my email in the chat, Vitali. Right? Oh no, that one just went to Rob. Everyone. <laughs> fantastic. Anybody else got a question or a, a, a thing? You're holding up your drumsticks. Sorry, I've been off camera because I'm frantically trying to learn marimba. I've got the record stuff this weekend and it's been in the loft for three years. So I'm trying. To, so that's, um, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this into an articulate question, but I just wondered, thank you again for um, third, second, third, fourth. Uh, thanks, but it's really stimulating and relevant talk. And I'd be interested on your podcast. Thank you. Um, please, be, could you put the link to that in the, in the chat as well? If it's current or forthcoming? It, it's forthcoming. I, I've done several episodes and I want to wait until I have at least 10 or 12 before I drop the first one so that I can stay a, ahead of it, you know, that is to say that I can drop them periodically and while I, if, if something comes up in life, I don't miss a week, you know, that kind of a thing. So uh, it's, it's coming. Charles, do you want to keep me in the loop and then I can drop it into the messenger group as and when you're ready to release and then people will know it's there? Yeah, happy to do that. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Uh, Hugh. Sorry, my, my, question, my question was, sorry, it's not a question, but more oh, pondering, yeah. just, just if I could um, um, jinx this and, and, and like, but I just wondered how, if Aikido had, if you'd come up with a holistic philosophy of education in Aikido, in the sense that it's, is it possible to teach or is it necessary to learn or is it a yin and yang thing that you must, the teacher must match to the learner and must be a reciprocal process or, yeah, um, why, why can't I still play marimba after all these years? <laughs> <laughs> but something to do with motivation and whether Aikido has shaped your philosophy of education and that. And sorry, yeah, next question. Um, thank you, Finn. I, I would definitely say it has influenced my philosophy of education, um, without a doubt. And it's influenced my philosophy about just about everything. But uh, certainly because I spend so much time thinking about teaching and learning and growth and evolution, I, it has definitely influenced my, my thinking about, about this process, for sure. Right. Um, and you use the word, you know, reciprocal. It definitely, it feels to me like a, uh, one of the ways is that it highlights the, the reciprocity inherent in, in our communication. That speaker and listener are both engaged and both ideally transformed in the same way that Uke and Tori or Uke and Nage are both engaged and growing through the process of interacting. Um, it's not one doing to the other or one taking from or even giving to the other. It's both giving to the interaction and something else evolves and emerges. And so it definitely influences my, my teaching practice for sure. Wonderful. Hugh, you're next and then Liz. There a couple of quick ones. One, one is, thank you very much, wonderful. Uh, one is, do you 
face uh, any time or problem, particularly with young adults and teenagers on the who are coming to this for the first time in terms of physical contact? Yeah, sometimes. Um, and if I understand correctly, are you suggesting that, you know, somebody is having difficulty with physical contact and yes. They, they may be nervous of physical contact, particularly if they've had no sort of general sporting or team background and it's a kind of a new thing. Yes, for certain, uh, it, either it could be that they, they didn't think of themselves as particularly physical. Maybe they were shamed when they were younger on a, on a playing field and they think of themselves, well, that's just not me. And they've structured their identity around not being physical or not being sporty or something like that. Or so how, how, how do you break through that fairly quickly in a, in a first Aikido class? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would, I would go on just a little bit further that that could be one of the, the reasons behind it. It could also be something much more serious. They could have been traumatized in some way yeah. from yeah. their early childhood. And so they have a, a understandable fear and resistance about physical contact at that point. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it really comes down to, you know, really listening into who they are and what their issue is and how, how fast or how slow or how surface or superficial the contact can be or how deep it can be. And I think this is just as true with adults as it is with children, um, that uh, in order to, to make meaningful contact, uh, I try to be as receptive and responsive to the person with whom I'm working. Um, my primary teacher, Endo Shihan, puts it this way. He's, he says, if, if it's on a scale of one to 10, and the person arrives with one, mm. then you meet them with nine to complete the 10. If they come with eight, you meet them with two to complete the 10. Mm. So if this person is coming with, <laughs> that's how they want to contact. It doesn't take yeah. very much. You don't have to add much to that. There's already so much energy in the system. Yeah. But if you have a, a student or a child who's completely shut down and very difficult to reach, I may have to go to them more mm -hmm. to make the contact, but I still, the contact itself is still very uh, gentle mm -hmm. in both cases. The, the space between is not <clears throat> filled up. The space between is still modulated to try and make uh, a, a vibrant interface between the two, but with the one who's holding way back, I may have to go the extra distance to make contact. Mm -hmm. And with the one That's who's a very coming, nice answer. Us, yeah, yeah. Super. Just gently. Now, this this holds true for somebody who's feeling um, emotionally very out there versus emotionally back, mm -hmm. physically out there or physically back. Mm -hmm. And so it it becomes. I'm sorry, I can't give a more um, concrete example other than I think it has a lot to do with deep listening and receptivity, and then responding to what they're showing up with. Thank you. No, it's a very rich answer. The, the second quick question I wanted to ask was, uh, do, do you use randori a lot in your classes? I love randori. And, you know, once people have enough footwork in, in their body, once they have enough of an ability to step off a line, um, I find that there is, there's a lot of joy that comes out of randori and it can be modulated. You know, you can use, with little kids, you can use noodles, you know, those little mm. foam noodles, or then you can, you know, graduate up to, to different kinds of uke initiation, whether it's with a shinai or, or with a boken or with, a, you know, Paul does these beautiful things with tissue paper um, to activate people's fight or flight response and see how they can learn to calm it and step off the line or stand there and realize it's not going to hurt them anyway. And all sorts of beautiful things that Paul Linden sensei does with that. Um, so then, you know, it can be showman, yokoman, ski, any, depending upon the group, I find Rondori is very joyful um, when people are ready for it. And of course it can be modulated up to, any attack, any response for attackers, you know, <laughs> but you can also begin in a very sort of uh, uh, modulated way for whatever the group is ready to receive. 
fabulous. Thank you. Liz. Oh, but thank you, Charles. That's really interesting. Um, something I wanted to explore with you a little bit further are about different approaches to teaching Aikido to children and adults. So I remember seeing one teacher once who um, was very good at teaching sort of adults and children. And he used to obviously approach sort of adult classes in very much the adult exercises that you do to learn Aikido, all the classic exercises. But if he was running a children's class, he would be mainly doing it through kids games, tag and other things, and teaching Aikido principles through games that the kids might almost play anyway. And then that would sort of lead into more traditional Aikido. I just wondered if you had any reflections or tips on that. Hmm. I um, First of all, thank you also for your kind words and, and thank you for being here to participate. It's a great question. Um, I think that I, um, I do use games sometimes. Um, I do use technique um, sometimes. And I think what I try to do is to have a, a clear idea of what I'm hoping to communicate that day. And then maybe I do, maybe I don't, or maybe I approach it in a number of different ways in the hopes that the largest number of people on the tatami that day would have received it by the end of the class. Um, and so I think it comes down to like getting very clear about what it is I'm trying to communicate. Um, one of the lessons that came to me about that came from a horse trainer. This was one of those horse trainers who, who trains horses um, to be ridden without bridles, without saddles, without, you know, eventually they get to the point where you can just walk up to the horse, gently touch it, jump up on its back and ride and communicate with leg pressure and where your body weight is as to where the horse should go. And so I was quite intrigued by this level of, of communication, you know, cross species communication. And when I went to watch uh, this man teach a two year old colt that had never been ridden, uh, it was like watching an Aikido Shihan, like a complete master teacher of teachers. Like he knew exactly what he was doing. He, um, after watching him, I asked him, what were you doing there? And he explained to me not only his methodology, but he said, this first session was really just designed to get the horse to stop, turn and look at me and give me its full attention. That was all. The only thing he was trying to do on the first day of class was to establish that whenever he wanted to, with his body, by getting closer to the horse or farther away from the horse, he could increase the pressure or decrease the pressure. And using that, he could teach the horse. He would increase the pressure. The horse would start running around in a circle and he would increase the pressure. And when the horse stopped, he would back off a little when the horse would turn and look at him, he would back off even more. And he, he said he would do that for as long as it took. If it took 20 minutes, okay. If it took 40 minutes, okay. If it took an hour, okay. That's all he was teaching that day. And so in response to your question, I guess what I would say is that I try to have an idea of what I want to communicate that day. And then I'll, I'll just keep trying until we get there. Um, and sometimes that'll involve a game. And sometimes that'll involve a technique. Sometimes it'll just involve, you know, something from the warm ups. I want everybody working together. So there's been this phenomenal research around synchronous play. I don't know if you're familiar with this concept. You probably are, but whenever we do something in sync with each other, if we sing, if we clap, if we swing our arms together, if we're doing a Rimi Tenkan all together and staying together, something fascinating happens in our neurobiology. And we get literally in sync with each other rhythmically. So I think our marimba player is still here. It's about rhythm. When we get, when we get, when we do that, um, the group bonds and we create a better feeling. Um, and the research on this was fascinating. They took preschool children and they put them on a swing set that was engineered. And the swing set was engineered so that students or the kids would be swinging in sync with one another for three minutes. And then they would stop the swing set and the kids would get off and they'd give them a task that they had to accomplish together. Another group 
they had the swing sets going counter to one another, out of sync with each other for three minutes. And then they would stop the swing set and give them the same task. And then another group that didn't get on the swing set and they gave them the task. So that was their control. What they found was that the group of kids, this is preschoolers who were in sync with one another for three minutes, exhibited more pro-social behavior, more collaboration, they accomplished the tasks better and they had fewer conflicts in doing so just by getting in sync with one another. And I realize we do this all the time, that's warm-ups. That's Aikido warm-ups. And when it's done consciously and deliberately and you think, okay, how can I get everyone moving together? We're doing breathing exercises together, but not just here I am doing it really quickly, see if you can keep up with me people, but really getting the group together for a sustained period of time, this creates a social glue and a better sense of like a dojo unity now we're starting to build the trust necessary to go more deeply into technique. And so yeah, it's fascinating, right? I mean, how simple it is. That, brilliant. Um, if you look up on the internet for synchronous play, you'll find the research papers on it. Um, and then there's a guy named um, Daniel Pink who wrote a, a much more general piece called When. And it's about timing. And, um, and it's, it's sort of a more general piece that from which you can get a, a much more extensive bibliography. But if you look up synchronous play, it's just fascinating. So in answer to your question, <laughs> um, it really, for me, it comes down to getting clear about what it is I'm trying to communicate. And once I've done that, then I will try anything. I'll try games, I'll try technique, I'll try synchronous play, I'll try whatever else until that one idea is, is through. And then it's practice time. You know, Once I've communicated, I can step out of the way and just give people a chance to practice, change partners, do it, you know, and then see where it goes from there. Usually I can't get more than one thing done in a session. So I just try to keep it simple. Thank you, that's very helpful. Our final question, like Jamie. Uh, yeah, so I'm really glad uh, my question's coming after what you just talked about with the synchronous play. Um, yeah, and it's always great to connect with you, Charles. It's just like, you know, all these uh, <laughs> intersections <laughs> from our Aikido and everything he says and what we're weaving in, so it's awesome. Um, uh, what I wanted to um, bring up was um, with Don Levine, you know, being uh, as prominent as he was in Ethiopia and uh, working with the government, et cetera, uh, was actually able to have the government approve Aikido as, um, I call it, uh, Peace PE, yeah? <laughs> so uh, here's physical education, right? But in the schools and to have it approved in the school ministry, uh, and, you know, there have been so many issues. It didn't really spread the way that we've hoped. But, you know, the actually the groundwork is there. I've always thought and talked with um, a couple of educator friends of mine in the West Bank around, you know, how could we get Aikido kind of into the schools as <clears throat> peace PE? Now, I don't know if we can call it peace PE because peace is actually a kind of a, you know, no-no word, <laughs> unfortunately. Can't even get a peace, uh, Department of Peace here. But, you know, but, but this sort of uh, PE in the schools, but with a consciousness that, uh, and as you're talking about, you know, the synchronicity, how do we build, um, and uh, to, Rob, to your point, sort of uh, market in a sense, and say to schools uh, and uh, school authorities, um, or, you know, um, around the value of Aikido as a physical education plus, shall we say. So I wonder, you know, any of your thoughts on that or, or work? Um, or, that you may have done or, or you know, um, sort of visions for the future, because I'm, I'm always passionate about this idea. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, as you know, I am too. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's what I'm asking. And, you know, bringing up, you know, Don Levine and his contribution, not only to the formation of Ikea Extensions, which uh, I was there, you know, in the beginning, like he approached me as we began it. I even wrote the first newsletter you know, with and for him, and continued to serve on IQ extensions for a number of years on the board and in various projects. And um, also, when Don wanted to step away from uh, the Owasa project in Ethiopia, he asked me if I would pick it up, and I did, and served as the, the external coordinator for Owasa 
uh, Peace Dojo um, mm -hmm. for a couple of years before handing it off to Lewis Pollock, who's currently the out of country coordinator. Yep. Um, and during that time, um, you know, I had many, many stories to tell, but the one that relates to this is that uh, during that time, um, Lewis Pollock asked me if I would help him to write a curriculum for the Owasa Peace Dojo. Um, and I said, sure. And what we did is we took, imagine a, a curriculum that has three columns down it. Now there's more information on it about staff development and the philosophy behind it, but imagine the actual nuts and bolts curriculum of it. There are three columns. And in one column you have physical practices or techniques, everything from Seiza to Shomenuchi Riminage as you move through the ranks from, I think we made either 12th or 10th Q all the way through to first, or maybe we did sixth at first into Shodan. We stopped at Shodan for that one. Um, but we went through the full curriculum of physical techniques, the canon of Aikido techniques down one column, broken up in terms of its Q ranks, and each one had a card associated with it. So you'd look at 6Q and it would tell you, these are the physical things you need to learn for 6Q. But we didn't stop there. A lot of dojos do that. What we then did is we said, okay, the next column is what are the emotional skills that we want you to have in order to also accomplish your 6Q level. Mm -hmm. And then the third column was the bridge to the leadership capacity and leadership abilities that would be developed should you have the physical and the emotional columns, you would then explicitly be exhibiting this kind of leadership ability. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we made very clear pedagogical step-by-step -step process. And then we sent the whole curriculum and the cards to, um, to Awasa. And you know, to the extent that they've used it, it's, it's hard to know. Um, because as you know, as you've alluded to, this, this concept of peace in Ethiopia, um, it's anathema. That is to say, it is considered a bad word <laughs> by the government. Uh, the government considers that if you're working on peace, that you are somehow um, against the government, mm -hmm. and therefore uh, to be eliminated. They have a very horrible track record of, of uh, eliminating their opposition. And so um, it was quite remarkable that the, the Minister of Education approved Aikido. We made certain to not use the word peace. So they, they approved um, of Aikido as a certified physical education practice countrywide. Mm -hmm. and Aikido in Ethiopia has grown. Uh, it has, oh, yeah. and as the dojo continues, you know, and people graduate from the dojo and move to various university studies in different towns and stuff, they have brought Aikido with them. So it's a beautiful thing um, as to how that has evolved. Um, I also think that, you know, you bring up Palestine, Israel, uh, and the conflicts there and whether or not Aikido can play a role in that. Um, I think it can. I think I know it does, as you know better than I. Um, well, we, I mean, we started the Middle East Aikido project. We had to take the word peace out of it. It, it was originally called the Salam Shalom project. We had to, it was peace, peace. We had to get rid of all that. Then we yeah. just went Middle East Aikido peace project, got rid of the peace. It's just the Middle East Aikido project. But yeah, we were going, uh, you know, Don, I, and, you know, as we started that back, but it's, it's still, it's still definitely going. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's kind of like at this stage, I'd like to see how we can become more um, uh, prevalent in the schools and uh, it gain a reputation uh, for Aikido as a, um, this sort of uh, self-cultivation and uh, cross, cross uh, cultural uh, relationship cultivation practice through physical education. I mean, and starting of course with the physical, which everybody needs. Yeah, I think, I think it is a very fruitful and useful pathway in to those very difficult places. That, and, and there is potential for real transformation. Obviously it worked for all of us. <laughs> so it well, I'll chat with you a little more. I didn't know that you had, you know, actually, um, you know, laid out that curriculum. So yeah, I'll talk with you about it. I was going to say, I sense, I sense another session or a further conversation here for sure. Um, we've kind of reached the time where uh, I just want to thank you for, for a really informative and, and exciting evening. I really enjoyed our conversation. Um, 
yeah, just just thanks, Charles. It's been great, and I will follow up on on uh, with you uh, post post the session. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you everybody for showing up. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and um, yeah, see you next week. Thank you everybody, and thank you. Thank, thank you, Charles. Spectacular. Thank you. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you, everybody. Thank, yep. thank you. Come on. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.